Okay, in this video, we're going to be going over Roman history that is going to expand from the end of the Second Punic War, which is going to be, remember, at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, to hopefully the death of Sulla in around 78. So, as usual, I'll be saying certain things that you can put in uh, for Canvas in order to be able to earn yourself an easy and free 100 for watching. So, let's give it some context. So, now, following the Battle of Zama in 202 BC, we're getting into the Second Punic War, obviously. Rome is for the first time now going to become somewhat aggressively imperialistic. Remember, as I've said before, that whenever they have increased their size, and then first encompassing the whole of the Italian Peninsula, and then obviously fighting the first two Punic Wars against Carthage, surrounding obviously the uh, islands of uh, Sicily, and then later Sardinia and Corsica, which at the end of the First Punic War becomes the very first provinces. Now they are going to look to the east for the first time, and here they're going to find the remnants of the great empire as made by Alexander the Great, upon whose death in 323 it was to be split apart in what is known as the Diadochi or the Diadochi. And they are going to see over here for the first time dollar signs, uh, because they were rather wealthy kingdoms, and Rome is going to much be interested in, obviously, uh, uh, going over there and via conquest, obviously, adding to the wealth of their empire and the like. So you can see here you have the Great Seleucid Empire, that of course is the major part of the remnants of the former empire of Alexander the Great. You have the Empire of Pergamum, which is going to be that right here, what you can see in northern Turkey. You will have, obviously, the Ptolemaic Empire, because of the name of his general Ptolemy that he had given it to um, upon his death. And then you have Macedonia, and also you can look a little bit at the Epirin Empire, the, or the, you should say, the Kingdom of Epirus, which, of course, uh, is going to be that empire from which Pyrrhus came in the Great Pyrrhic Wars. So, Rome is going to fight a series of wars known as the Macedonian Wars. And in the Macedonian Wars, obviously so-called because it is Macedonia, you have obviously that conquest of Greece particularly, and the whole of the East uh, begin in earnest, as it were. The first Macedonian War is going to be fought with Macedonia, simultaneously with the fighting of the Second Punic War. And Macedonia at the time is going to be the kingdom led by Philip V, uh, a descendant, obviously, of Alexander the Great, whose father's name was also Philip, but he, of course, uh, was Philip II. Well, the great thing that occurs at the onset of the Second Macedonian War is that you learn that the Roman way of fighting is going to be the superior way. You have a matchup between Rome on one side, and on the other side you have both Macedonia, led by Philip the Fifth, and the Seleucid Kingdom, Antiochus III, allied together. Well, the great battle that you need to remember is going to occur in 197, you can see it is right here, and it is called Sinuscephaly. And in that year you have Titus Quinctius Flamininus, I have misspelled and I've left out the N, so it's Flamininus, he defeats Philip the Fifth of Macedon, and it shows that the Roman legion and the way by which it is organized and the way by which it obviously forms itself on the battlefield is superior to that of the Macedonian phalanx. So the phalanx is going to be just one big red rover, red rover, send one over, all the men in a singular mass clashing against the other men, whereas the Roman army, the advantage it has, is it's like made up of nanobots, and so therefore it's the division that can then be in more divisions, we can be in more divisions, and then obviously come back together just like nanobots from Big Hero 6 can do as well. Well, that is going to decide the, of course, uh, Second Macedonian War, which leads to the following year of 196, in which you have uh, Flamininus proclaiming that the Greeks were going to be free from Macedonian rule at the Isthmian Games. Uh, the note, it does not say that they're going to be free outright, because the Romans are obviously going to uh, supersede the Macedonians as those that are the rulers over, of course, uh, the uh, Greeks themselves, as it were. So we come to, very quickly, your first word that you're going to put in, Philip V, as in Philip V, P-H-I-L-I-P. V. No spaces, but Philip V, who is, of course, the loser. We then immediately go into the Third Macedonian War. And in the Third Macedonian War, it again is going to end up with an ultimate Roman victory at the Battle of Pydna in 168. And essentially, it brings an end to the remnants of Alexander's Macedonian Empire and gave all Roman supremacy for essentially 
all intents and purposes, over the Hellenistic East. Hellenistic means obviously Greek-like. Hellenic means Greek. But at any rate, the ruler, or the winner I should say, at the Battle of Pydna is going to be none other than a member of one of the greatest families in the entirety of the Res Publica, and that would be Lucius Aemilius Paulus. And because of his great victory at Pydna in 168, Lucius Aemilius Paulus is going to gain the Agnomen Macedonicus, and thus brings an end with that battle the Third Macedonian War. And we come to, immediately almost therein, the next item that you need to put in, which is Paulus. P-A-U-L-U-S. Paulus, who gained the name of Macedonicus. So now, it brings us to the Fourth Macedonian War, which is going to coincide almost at the exact same time as the Third Punic War. Remember that at the end of the Second Punic War, you have many people like Cato the Elder, a censor that is going to be clamoring for the ultimate and complete destruction of Carthage, and so that is why Cato the Elder always ended every single speech he gave with the statement, Cartago de linda est, Carthage must be destroyed. And so, using a pretense of, obviously, that Carthage had gotten out of line from the agreements that it had given at the end of the Second Punic War, a Third Punic War is going to, obviously, come into being, and it will be a very short-lived affair, unlike the Second Punic War and the Third Punic War against Carthage, it is going to be an annihilation of Carthage. The fellow who leads the annihilation is Publius Cornelius Aemilianus. That tells you that he was adopted from that famous Aemilius family that obviously Paulus was a part of, into the Cornelian family, the Scipios as it were, and that's why we call him Aemilianus. He is the grandson, adoptive grandson, of the great man who had defeated Hannibal. Publius Cornelius Scipio. Well, at any rate, he will absolutely destroy Carthage, and the legend is that they actually salted the earth so that nothing would actually grow there again. There is going to be a new Carthage, but this is going to be a Roman colony, as in a Roman Carthage, which will obviously replace it. Well, in that same year of 146 BC, in which Publius Cornelius, Aemilianus, Scipio, and much like his adoptive grandfather, he will gain the name Africanus. And so you can tell the difference between the two Publius Cornelius Scipios by the one that's going to be uh, Aemilianus, and you would say Africanus Minor, the younger, versus, uh, of course, Maior, the elder, as it were. The other thing that is going to happen in that same year of the destruction of Carthage in 146 is going to be a sack of Corinth, bringing it into the Fourth Macedonian War. The Fourth Macedonian War is going to conclude with a sack of Corinth that you can see there, and that sack is led by Lucius Mummius. And for all intents and purposes, you bring to an end what we call Hellenic history or slash Greek history, because it's at that point all of Greece, there is no part of it that is not completely and utterly a part of the Roman Empire. And so in that one singular year, remember, you have the two great events of the, of course, uh, sack of Corinth by Lucius Mummius, bringing it into Greek history, and now it is all part of Roman history. And then, of course, you have the destruction and utter destruction of Carthage in that same exact year. So please make sure you remember both of those. Now, we move on to a change in the res publica. Remember that up until this point, essentially there were a group of maybe about 20 to 40 families that were intermarrying, adopting each other. We saw that with the adoption of the Emilian into the Cornelian family, that was essentially had a stranglehold upon all the power in Rome. And you're going to see drastic, drastic changes over the time period that we have just been talking about, the end of the Second Punic War, up until these guys come along, the two Gracchi boys, as it were. You have also a growing effect of this time of the burgeoning of these great plantations called Latifundia. They are huge farms controlled by the interest of the senators, but yet farmed with slave labor. And in that way, as they get larger, they push out the small farmer, the small individual landowner, which is hugely important because it is that small landowner that serves in the Roman army. There is a law that says in order to serve the Roman army, you have to own land. And in that way, obviously, you are fighting for Rome because you own a part of Rome. It's the land that you own. And so that is going to be a huge, huge shift that we see the shrinking of, necessarily, that group of uh, people, those are the landowners, that can serve in the army. The other thing that you see a great rise of are people that are known as equites. And equites, singular, and the plural, of course, is going to be equites, literally means knights, as in people who have a horse. Equus is the word for horse. But by the time we get to here, 
it is no longer going to mean people that have a horse and can provide it for the Roman cavalry in the Roman army. Instead, it is going to be like the business class. And so you had to own a certain amount of money. I think it was something along the lines of 400,000 sesterces, like being a millionaire in our terms, I suppose, to be a member of the equites. And so that is going to be an important development. Then finally, the last thing that you truly need to know as a new development is that now we have a situation right around the time of the rise of the Gracchi, which is going to be 133, but it had been going on before, is that you essentially have two types of people who are rising in power. One type of people are going to be those that use the traditional mechanisms and the traditional routes of power, i.e. the Senate approving your positions, and those people think of themselves as the best people, and so they are called the optimates or the optimates. optimates. Then you have a whole nother group of people that are essentially going to bypass the Senate, go behind the back of the Senate, directly to the people, and I'm going to make a very short video explaining how the Roman government is all set up. That is coming soon. And by going behind the back of the Senate, what they will do is that they then use the mechanisms of power to go directly to the people to approve whatever sort of things that they wish. And they would be known as the populares. populares. And these two groups are going to come to dominate the next 100 years of Roman history. It is wrong to think of it in terms of the optimates are only for the elites and the populares are those politicians and generals in the Roman army that are trying to help out the people. No, it is merely the mechanisms and the route by which they gain their power. And so they go through the Senate and get the Senate to approve of what they want to get accomplished and these people go directly to the people. Both sets of them are only about themselves, but it is the way by which they will grant or gain their power that they so want. All right, so with that in mind, let's now then enter into the Gracchi. These are two children who are the sons of the daughter of the man who had defeated Hannibal. Her name, Cornelia, and these are her two jewels. And the story goes that as a woman was over here visiting our gal Cornelia, she's showing off her jewels, and she says, what about your jewels? And Cornelia pulls her two sons, Tiberius Gracchus and Gaius Gracchus, and say that these are then my jewels. They are reformers. What they do, and whether they want necessarily their deeds to be the benefit of Rome, or whether they're seeking to gain personal power, they change everything in the year 133. Tiberius Gracchus, the older of the two, is going to introduce legislation to solve the land crisis of Latifundia. Remember the expanding Latifundia, which are worked by slave labor, shrinking out the population of landowners, and in that way, they want necessarily to take some of that land that is growing in the Latifundia, that is supposedly public land, but controlled by interest of the senators, and to then distribute it to poor people and other people who don't own land, thereby growing a class of people that have it, as it were. Well, that is something the Senate does not want, because obviously it would be taking away the influence of the senators and the resources of the senators. And so, therefore, what is going to happen is that when he does the unthinkable, he is the first guy as a popular to go back behind the back of the Senate and go directly to the people and have them obviously indicate what he wants them to do and has laws passed. The reason he is able to do this is that he is a tribune. A tribune is one that can go directly to a group of people, one of the assemblies of the people, and call it in a meeting, have it vote on whatever he wants them to vote on, and usually they're going to go along with whatever he wants. And so by going back behind the back of the Senate and getting done what he wants with this new redistribution of land and increasing of the group of people that own property for the people who can then serve in the Roman army, the Roman Senate is going to stir up violent mobs, and essentially they're going to kill him in 133 BC in violence, and thus it begins that flashpoint of that time period between 133 all the way to 31, in which on my timeline I'm always drawing him as being healed in his and pickled in this, this is that flashpoint. And so you can read all the other things that he is wanting to do with other sorts of reforms, but essentially it is going to be made such that it is now a two groups. You have the group that he is a part of, which is a popularist trying to go behind the back of the Senate, 
versus those that would be the, of course, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, optimates. Uh, ten years later, roughly, <coughs> his younger brother Gaius is going to be elected tribune, and you can see it in 123, and he's going to try even more reforms. He is a more gifted politician and a speaker than his brother, and uh, essentially, he is going to not only try and make an increase with reed land distribution of those that owned land for serving in the army, he is also going to introduce the Lex Frumentaria, citizenship for Italian allies. Remember that the Italians are not Romans, they are the allies, the Socii, and all sorts of other things. So the Senate is going to issue what is known for the first time as the Senatus Consultum Ultimum, the final decree of the Senate, with a directive that it empowers the consuls who have that, indeed, power of life and death to do anything necessary to ensure the safety of the res publica. And so again, with domestic kind of civil war violence, he is going to be killed in the year 121. So, uh, unlike his brother, he successfully re-ran for Tribune, because remember the Tribune can go back behind the back of the Senate, but he is going to be killed in that violence that we find. Now, we're going to zoom ahead a few years to the rise of Gaius Marius. Gaius Marius is going to be a popularis, which means obviously he gains his power directly from the people. Well, there is a war that is raging in Northern Africa, and that is because the ribnets of the uh, Punic Wars is still going to be along here, even though Carthage is necessarily gone, is that there is this place or a group called the Numidians, and Numidia is ruled over by Jugurtha. There is a whole thing about how obviously it came to be that he was in power. You have Nikipsa, the successor to Masinissa, who was the king of Numidia, but then just know that Jugurtha is the one to then take the throne, stir up trouble for the Romans, and thus you have the Jugurthine War. It's out of the Jugurthine War that you find that Marius is going to, as a Noah's homo, run for office as a command consul, then su supplant the man whom he had been serving in, in the Jugurthine War. So Marius didn't start fighting and leading the Roman side of the Jugurthine War, but he definitely is going to be obviously the one who finishes it. And so therefore he runs for consul for the first time. Nobody in his family had ever been so. That makes him a Noah's homo, and he is going to be successful. He is so successful that he is going to go on a run. By the way, your third item that you're going to put in is Gracchus, the name of both Tiberius and the younger brother. G-R-A-C-C-H-U-S. Gracchus. Put that in. Now, when he wins the uh, battle of Jugurtha, or the war against Jugurtha, the Jugurtha War, it is going to be that he is going to run for consul successfully in the year 107, 104, 103, 102, 101, 100, and then finally 86, seven times total. What he does is going to be revolutionary, because he, much like the Gracchi, recognized there was a problem with the Roman army and only allowing those that own land, because you're running out of people to serve in the army, is that he is going to open the army to have it be served by what are known as the class of people without land, the Capite Cainci. Literally, it means those having been counted by their head. In other words, normally you were counted in the census by how much property you owned, how much money. They are ultimately known as the proletarii. This is going to be a problem, and in many ways, I think, the beginning of the end of the race publica. Because if you do not own land, you are serving in the army, you are not fighting for Rome or the Senate or the government, you are fighting for your general, which would be Marius. And so this is going to open up the opportunity for what is going to arise, which is a series of civil wars, uh, starting with Marius and the great rival Marius, who will come along. So, 107, he is elected consul because of what he does with the Jugurthine War, and then you have, 104, 3, 2, and 1, another crisis that the Roman Senate stupidly will give too much power to one man, and that one man is Marius. What he does is that these people from up here, known as the Cimbri and the Teutones, they are going to come down and invade in the area that we would consider to be northern Italy, but for the Romans they consider it to be southern Gaul. And so that he positions himself as the great savior for the Romans because they're paranoid, because they remember the Gallic invasion of 390 BC, and so therefore they give all of that power, electing him consul multiple times in order to be able to deal with the Cimbri and the Teutoni. During this time as well, he is going to reform the army, and these are the famous Marian reforms. He is a military 
genius. He is brilliant. And in doing this reform of the army, he makes what had already been a rather successful unit called the Manipular Army into now a cohortal army. And that nanobot that I described with the Battle of Sinus Kefali in 197 is going to be even more versatile and even greater in its ability to be flexible and to break apart and then come back together as necessary. So, he is going to have so much power consolidated in himself in that he is consul in all of those years, but in the year 100, a political alliance that he creates allows him, or indeed it oversteps his bounds, and so he is then going to fall out of power. And in doing so, obviously, uh, bring an end to the absolute influence and domination that Marius had had for a good long time. Now, what will then next happen in the Roman sphere is that there is going to be a horrific war to break out between Rome and its allies. The allies of Italy, remember, are the strength of Rome in its kind of cohesiveness, but they are not being given full citizenship, and that's exactly what they want. And so when Livius Drusus comes along, a tribune, who remember it can go behind the back of the Senate, it is the Senate's obstinacy and their stubbornness which very often will cause all these problems, is that once in mob violence, encouraged by the Senate, he is going to be killed in 91 BC because he was advocating for allies to get citizenship. It is going to now be then the beginning of what we know of as the social wars. These are the wars between Rome and its allies. And the result, ultimately, of the social wars is going to be that they are going to gain it. They last do the social wars between 90 BC and 88 BC. And perhaps most importantly that comes out of the social wars is the rise of a particular military man who will come to be the great rival to Marius, who even though he's not consul, he still has a lot of influence politically and he has a lot of very loyal soldiers in his army, and that is, of course, uh, Cornelius Sulla, and he's the last guy that we are dealing with. But your fourth item that you need to put in is Marius, M-A-R-I-U-S. Marius is your fourth item to put in there. Now, Sulla is going to have granted to him at the end of the social wars, which were brought to an end by the Lex Julia, passed in 90 BC, which granted citizenship to the non-rebelling allies, and then finally the Lex Plautia Papiria, which you can see in your study guide. But uh, over in the east, there is a fellow by the name of Mithridates. He is a king, and as he is a king on 88 BC, he had butchered tens upon tens upon tens of thousands of Romans in this area of the world. Rome now needs to deal with him. And so you're going to have a series of wars known as the Mithridatic Wars. So, well, after his success in the social wars, Sulla is going to be granted a command. Both Sulla and his men want to go fight in the Mithridatic Wars, the second Mithridatic War. And the reason why is because it means money. Money for Sulla, money for the men, there's the sacking of towns, there's the, of course, granting of land, of the territory, and all all these sorts of things like that. Now, what is going to happen is that as Sulla is preparing to go off and fight against this fellow, Marius and the others of the Populares, because Sulla is an optimate, he goes through the Senate to grant whatever or get whatever power that he is going to get, is that he is going to do the unthinkable, and the unthinkable is to march on Rome. And when he marches on Rome, it is an outright civil war. And so you have the forces of Marius and all of his supporters who go behind the back of the Senate, the Populares, and Sulla and all of his supporters, which are going to be the senatorial, against each other. Well, what he does not have, Marius, as though what Sulla does, is an active army at which he is the command. And so when he marches on Rome in 88 BC, having usurped the authority to go fight against Mithridates, he then gains it back, because what else is the Senate going to do but say, yes, you with that army that can kill everybody here, you have that command back again. And so therefore, he is going to go off and fight in the Mithridatic War. Sulla, meanwhile, while he is fighting, is going to then have many of his factions against him that are the populares behind his back, not the least of which is Marius. Gets himself elected 86 BC after Sulla has now gone off to fight against Mithridates. However, by this time he's rather old and he dies. So when Sulla returns back into Rome, 
again he is going to have to deal with his enemies politically. Now, just a word about Mithridates of Pontus, that fellow who, of course, is now fighting against Sulla in the Second Mithridatic War. He was a wild character. He spoke over a hundred languages, his memory was legendary, and he was said to take poison every single day, lest he be poisoned. Uh, he was gaining immunity to it. And so, when Sulla returns, what he is going to do is that he is going to again march on Rome, fight a civil battle called the Battle of Colline Gate, and consolidate his own power. He is going to be declared dictator, and you can be dictator, dictator for six months, but he is going to be declared dictator in perpetuity for a longer period of time than that six months, and to eliminate any sort of political rivals, because he had to deal with them while he was off in the Mithridatic War, and he almost had that command against Mithridates, stolen away from him by Marius, his great rival, is that he's going to issue the proscriptions, those murder lists, that they will put on the speaker's platform, the rostrum, so-called because it featured the beaks of captured ships, and thus all just hell on earth was unleashed upon Rome in this chaotic time, because if you could go down, see whose name is on the list, go to their house, kill them, take their heads, chop them off, and were then displayed in the middle of the forum as well. It was a horrific time. But the good news is that Sulla almost dies immediately thereafter. Four years later, Sulla is dead. The position of the Senate is such that they can retake control of authority, but they stupidly, as we will see in the next video, immediately give that power away and create another monster. So here in this one we had the rivalry and the fighting of two men in a civil war against each other, that being Sulla on one side the Optimate versus Pompey on the other side of Popularis, and you have that civil strife that continues on that had started with, of course, the Gracchi, now in its most brutal form with these murder lists that we have here. So, your last item to put in is going to be that of Sulla. S-U-L-L-A. He, the great dictator, and by great I mean horrific dictator, who issued the proscriptions, the murder lists, against his political enemies. Thanks for watching. Keep studying.